So in part one of this audiovisual uh, presentation, we saw how, under the assumption of complete markets, one can go back and forth between the prices of contingent claims on the one hand and the price of complex assets on the other, where an arrow de brew contingent claim is a fictitious asset that pays off a dollar in one and only one state of the world in a future time period, and a complex asset is an asset that makes payoffs in more than one state of the world at some future date. Loosely speaking, what market completeness means is that either there is actually traded in financial markets a contingent claim for each possible state of the world looking ahead to the end of the investment horizon, whenever that may be, say a year from now, or alternatively, that there are enough complex assets traded to allow us to make inferences about what the price of each contingent claim for each possible future state of the world would be if contingent claims were actually traded in actual financial markets. And like we saw with the help of some examples from part one, in general, what that means is that there has to be at least as many complex assets traded as they are, as there are states of the world looking ahead to the end of the investment horizon, subject to the caveat that we talked about, the payouts on those various complex assets must be linearly independent. Now, these ideas regarding contingent claims and the use of contingent claims as fictitious assets or analytic devices that can be used to find the prices of more realistic assets like stocks and bonds goes all the way back to the path-breaking work done by Gerard de Bruin and a uh, Kenneth Arrow in the late 1950s and early 1960s. But for quite some time after the publication of Arrow and de Bruin's work, it remained unclear. We can see how in simple examples you can do this, going back and forth between contingent claims prices on the one hand and the prices of complex assets, including stocks and bonds, on the other. But these examples are very simple. They're highly stylized, you might say, oversimplified in the sense that they have at most two or three possible states of the world that one envisions looking ahead from today into the future to the end of the investment horizon. So it, would not, it was not clear right away how you could apply this analytic framework to the real world if in the real world you're managing funds you're thinking about allocating funds to the stock market, it's not just that the stock market could go up or it could go down between now and next year. There are a whole range of possibilities in between, a whole range of states of the world. And the question is, how can we use real world asset prices to draw inferences about the prices of contingent claims for all of those possible states of the world? The breakthrough along those lines didn't occur until 20 years later, when in the late 1970s, two groups of economists, two pairs of economists, Douglas Breeden and Robert Litzenberger, Rolf Bonds and Merton Miller, showed in their papers how in the real world, one could use the information in option prices to make inferences about contingent claims prices for a rich real world complex economy with a complex financial system like, for example, the United States today. So in this second part of the presentation, part C and D on the outline, we'll see exactly how Breeden and Litzenberger and Bonds and Miller did this, using options to make inferences about contingent claims prices and we'll proceed in two steps under heading C from our outline. We'll work through first still a series of simplified, stylized, oversimplified examples where we just think about two or three states looking ahead to the end of the investment horizon, but then we'll enrich the analysis to allow for many states of the world looking ahead to the future, dozens, 
maybe even hundreds of possible states, and we'll see how in the real world we can use information embedded, for example, into option prices, prices of options on stock indices like the Standard Poor's 500 to make inferences about contingent claims prices for the United States economy today. So to begin with a simple example first, let's go back to the example that we looked at before in part one of the presentation, where we have two periods today, period t equals zero, the end of the investment horizon, period t equals one, maybe that's a year from now. And let's imagine that there are three possible states of the world, i equals one, two, and three, that are possible looking ahead from today till the end of the horizon a year from now. So we can think maybe about there being a good state, a bad state, and a state somewhere in between. And let's suppose to begin with that only one asset is traded in financial markets in this uh, imaginary world. It's going to be a complex security, meaning one that makes payments in all three states of the world. Let's suppose in particular that PS1, the payoff of this complex security in state one is equal to a dollar. Let's suppose PS2 is two, two dollars in state two, PS3, three, three dollars in state three. And if we like, we can think about this complex asset as being like a stock. So state one would be the worst state where the stock sells for the low price of a dollar per share a year from now. Two, state two is the in-between state where the share price is two tomorrow or rather uh, a year from now. And uh, state three is the really good state where the price of the stock is equal to three one year from now. But now, in addition to the share of stock, let's introduce some options to buy shares of this stock. So now we need to fix some ideas and to introduce some terminology that's associated with the workings of options markets. So in particular, a call option. A call option is a financial contract that gives the buyer the right, but importantly, not the obligation to purchase a share of stock at a pre-specified price called the strike price, usually denoted by K, at, in this particular case where there are only two periods, at the end of the investment horizon, a period T equals one, more generally in a multi-period setting, the call option would allow uh, the buyer to purchase a share of stock at that strike price on or before some expiration date, capital T. Further jargon or lingo associated with options markets at T equals one, that is at expiration, the call is said to be in the money if the actual share price is above the strike price and out of the money if the actual share price is below the strike price. At t equals 1, at the end of the investment horizon, an option will have value only if it is in the money, only if it allows the holder to purchase the share at a strike price that is below the market price, uh, and it will have zero value otherwise. But moving back to today, time t equals 0, the option is going to have value even if there's only a probability of it being in the money at t equals 1. Now, if in this economy the stock is the only traded asset because there are three possible states at t equals 0, we know in advance that financial markets are going to be incomplete. There's no way of using information about the price and the payouts on the share of stock alone to figure out what all three contingent claims prices for all three states a year from now are going to be. Suppose, however, that in addition to the stock, we introduce two options on the stock, one that has strike price k equals 1, and the other has strike price k equals 2. Here are, or here is, some notation that we can use to keep track of the payout, payoffs generated by these two call options. The S, everything's color-coded, just refers to the fact that these are options on the stock as opposed to some other unspecified asset. 
and then the purple one and the two that appear inside parentheses make reference to whether we're talking about the call option with strike price k equals one or the option with strike price k equals two. The red subscript one simply indicates that this, these are both options with expiration date equal to t equals one. And uh, the i su uh, superscripts we can use these to keep track of the payoffs that the options make in each of the three possible states of the world at the expiration date, that is, at time one. And here, using the definitions and the way that options work, we can tabulate the payouts on each of the two calls in each possible state of the world, looking ahead to period t equals one. Let's focus first on the far right-hand side column, which gives the payouts for the call option with strike price equal to 2. It's important to recognize that the call option gives the holder the right, but not the obligation, to purchase the share of stock at $2 a share, looking ahead to period t equals 1. So in state 3, where the price of the shares turn out to be particularly high, $3 a share, the call option with strike price 2 gives the holder the right to purchase those shares for $2 each. So the holder will buy a share for $2, can immediately sell it for 3 pocketing the $1 difference. That $1 difference would be the payout that he or she receives from owning the call option with strike price 2 if state 3 comes about at time 1. In state 2, the price of the shares is equal to 2, so there's neither a gain nor a loss associated with exercising one's right to buy the shares. Either way, the payout is 0. You buy the stock at 2 by exercising the call, sell it at 2, and have a gain of 0, or you just let the call expire, and you still have a payoff of 0. In state 1, it's perfectly clear the price of the shares is equal to 1. You would never want to buy shares for 2 and immediately sell for 1. So in state 1, even the call option with uh, strike the call option with strike price 2 would uh, be allowed to expire uh, worthless in that first state. Now let's take a look at the column second from the right with the payouts for the call with strike price 1. In this particular case, in state three, the call allows you to buy the share at a dollar, and the market allows you to turn around and sell the share for three dollars, so you pocket the two dollar difference. That's the payoff you get from the call in state three. In state two, you can buy for one by exercising the call and sell for two in the market so your payout is a dollar. In state one, however, again, it doesn't really matter. You can buy a share of stock for one and sell it for one. The total payout is zero, or you can simply allow the call option to uh, expire. Worthless, you get zero either way. So we've now got three assets, the stock and the two calls with different strike prices, and now we can ask, does the addition of the two options make markets complete? Can we use this information, in other words, to make inferences about the prices at which contingent claims for each of the states would trade? And the answer is yes. If you take a look at the various patterns of payouts and ask how can I use these various assets to synthesize contingent claims for each of the three states. Take a look first over on the far right column. Those are the payouts for the call with strike price 2. Interestingly, the call, in this case with strike price 2, pays out a dollar in state 3 and zero otherwise. So the payoffs for the call with strike price 2 coincide exactly with those uh, of a contingent claim for state 3 so that we can just come out and say the option with strike price 2 is, in effect, a contingent claim for state 3. If you buy one call with strike price 1 and sell, or again, here's some terminology, when you buy a call, that gives you the right, but not the obligation, to purchase shares of stock 
at uh, a pre-specified strike price at a pre-specified date in the future, when by contrast on the other side you sell or write a call, you're in effect giving somebody else the right to purchase the shares at that strike price. So you receive the money that the buyer of the call pays for it today, but on the other hand you will be obligated to sell to him or her on demand a share of stock at the strike price when uh, the call expires on or before the expiration date, in this case at time t equals 1. So in this case, if you buy one call with strike price 1 and sell two calls with strike price 2, in state 1 you'll get 0 because both of the options are worthless in that case, they're out of the money. In state 2, the call that you've purchased with strike price 1 gives you the payout equal to 1, but because the market price and the strike price are both equal to 2 in state 2, if you're talking about the call with strike price 2, that uh, call expires worthless as well. You've got your payout equal to 1. In state 3, the call that you've purchased with strike price 1 is equal to $2, but on the other hand, because you've sold two options with strike price 2, you're obligated to sell to the holder for the price of $2 per share. Two shares of the stock, each of which costs $3 a share, so you're going to lose $2 on that leg, so to speak, of the trade. So plus 2 by buying the call with strike price 1, minus 2 by selling or writing two calls with strike price 2, you end up with nothing, but notice that those are exactly the same payouts as a contingent claim for state number two. And then finally, by buying one share of the stock, selling two calls with strike price one, and buying one call with strike price two, you can verify just by totaling up the payouts that you receive and must make in each possible state of the world that you're going to end up with a dollar in state one and zero otherwise, with that portfolio, you have synthesized a contingent claim for asset uh, for rather state one. Now, of course, it would also be possible to complete the market, so to speak, by introducing two other assets rather than the two options. So one additional stock and a bond or two additional stocks. But options here are an obvious choice to make since they're related to the assets that are already traded. Options often fall or said to fall under the broader category of derivative securities in the sense that their prices and payoffs ultimately depend on the price and payouts made by the underlying asset, in this case the shares of stock. And in addition, what we saw with the help of that first example is that options are often convenient to use because they give rise to a structure of payouts across, in this case, the two options and the share of stock that makes solving for contingent claims prices relatively easy. So for example, going back to the previous example, we saw that the call option with strike price two uh, is in effect a contingent claim for state 3. So if you wanted to know the price of a contingent claim for state 3 in that example, knowing the price of the call option uh, with strike price 2 will give you the price for the contingent claim. Now it would be terrific if this trick of introducing additional options on one single underlying share of stock always work to complete the market, so to speak, but this turns out not always to be the case. And to see why, suppose instead of going from 1 to 2 to 3 across the bad, intermediate, and good states looking ahead to period t equal 1, the stock in our example paid out or had a price of 2 in both states 1 and 2 at time 1 but then went up to three in the really good state, state three. Intuitively, the problem here will be that since the price of the stock does not differ across states one and two, it's not going to be possible to use the stock and the associated options to complete the markets for contingent claims.
So in particular, if we go ahead and recompute the payoffs from the options with strike prices one and two uh, for the stock that sells for $2 a share in both states one and two, we can see that a portfolio formed by buying two calls with strike price one and writing or selling one call with strike price k equals two yields a set of payouts equivalent to the payouts made by the stock itself. So we're back to uh, this technically inconvenient case where it is possible to replicate the payouts on one complex asset by forming a portfolio of the two other complex assets. The payouts are not linearly independent and therefore markets are incomplete. How can we solve this problem? Oftentimes we can solve the problem not by focusing on a single stock, but rather by forming portfolios of multiple stocks and then introducing a set of call options, not on individual stocks, but on the entire portfolio. So another example will serve to illustrate this basic point. So here, let's suppose now we have two stocks, stock S equal one and stock S equal two and the three states looking ahead to period t equals one and the table down at the bottom indicates that stock one will sell for price one dollar a share in states one and two two dollars in state three stock number two sells for a dollar a share in state one and two dollars a share in states two and three so if all we had was one of these stocks or the other we wouldn't be able to do this trick of using options to complete the market. The problem with stock one is that its price does not adequately distinguish between states one and two. And likewise, stock two, its price does not adequately distinguish between states two and three. But suppose we consider the payoffs made by a portfolio consisting of shares of both of these two stocks, say one share of each. By buying one share of stock one and one share of stock two, combining them into a portfolio, the portfolio is going to be worth $2 a share in state one in period t equals one, since each of the two companies will have one share in the portfolio selling for a dollar a piece. The value of the portfolio goes up to three in state two, since in that case, the price of a share in company two goes up to two. And in state three, the portfolio is worth four. So let's now consider this portfolio of the two stocks, but also add to the set of assets that are being traded call options on the whole portfolio, one with strike price K equals two, the other with strike price K equals three. So here I've expanded the table, the two Right-hand side columns give the payouts on a call on the entire portfolio consisting of one share of each of the two stocks with strike prices K equals two and K equals three. So on the far right, that call option with strike price three allows you to buy the whole portfolio at T equals one for $3. The portfolio itself is going to be worth four in state three, so the call itself in that particular state will be worth one, but in states one and two, the call will be expiring out of the money. The market price will be below the, the strike price and a holder of the call will never exercise. For strike price two, that call option gives you the right, but not the obligation to buy the entire portfolio for $2. So it's going to be worth $2 in state three, where the portfolio is worth four, $1 in state two, where the portfolio is worth three and nothing in state one. Now we can verify that the payoffs from the portfolio and the two options on the portfolio are again, linearly independent and markets are once again, complete. And as a matter of fact, you can verify that once more over on the far right, 
the call option with strike price equal to three has payoffs that are equivalent to the payouts on a contingent claim for state three, a dollar in state three, zero otherwise. You can synthesize a contingent claim for state two by buying one call with strike price two and selling or writing two calls with strike price three. And lastly, a contingent claim for state one can be constructed by buying half a share uh, in the uh, portfolio of stocks, writing one and one half calls with strike price two and buying one call with strike price three. That particular portfolio, if you multiply payouts by the units of each component that you buy, that's going to provide you with a dollar in state one and zero in states two and three its payoffs coincide with those of a contingent claim for state one. So just as we did before in part one of the presentation, we can use the insights that we glean from these initial examples to state another proposition. Proposition three says a necessary and sufficient condition to create a complete set of Arrow de Bruce securities, that is to synthesize a complete set of Arrow de Brew contingent claims, one for each possible state looking ahead from today to the future, is that A, there has to be a single portfolio of stocks that are traded with the property that options can be purchased and written on it, and B, that uh, portfolio must have a payoff pattern that distinguishes among all future states. So the value of the portfolio must be different in each possible state of the world looking ahead to the end of the investment horizon than it is in any other state. So now at last, with these insights in hand, we can begin to see how we might actually infer contingent claims prices in the real world, an economy like the United States. What we're looking for is a portfolio of shares whose value distinguishes between all possible states of the world as we look ahead from today to the end of our investment horizon, say, a year from now. One of the insights that we got from studying the capital asset pricing model is that the market portfolio, the portfolio of all stocks that are traded across all stock markets, let's say in the United States or maybe even the world if we're thinking internationally, the value of the market portfolio is likely to capture all underlying sources of aggregate risk. So that by taking a look at the value of the market portfolio as a whole, we can say how good or bad each possible state of the world is as we look ahead from today on into the future and we can distinguish as much as we like, as finely as we like, between possible states of the world looking ahead, let's say, from today until a year from now. We are the really good states or the ones where the market goes up by a lot, the really bad states or the states where the market goes down by a lot, and where all of the in-between states correspond to different intermediate values for the market portfolio as a whole. So this was the key insight that Bonds and Miller, Breeden and Litzenberger built into their analysis, showing us exactly how this could be done for the actual US economy. So let's see how we can use the market portfolio and associated call options to make inferences about contingent claims when we have a large number of potential states of the world looking ahead from today, let's say, until a year from now. Let's let PSI now denote the value of a share in the market portfolio for each in a potentially large number of states of the world looking ahead to period t equals one. So states here are being indexed by I running from one to capital N, where capital N can be as large as we want. So there's no need to confine our attention to good state, bad state, or good state, middle state, bad state. We can have dozens or literally hundreds of states. 
but to streamline the notation and to make it easier to talk about these different states of the world, let us label the states or relabel them as necessary so that we think about the best states as being the ones in which the market portfolio is worth the most and the worst states as the ones where the market portfolio is worth the least. So state one would be the one where the market portfolio has value PS1 that's the lowest of all possible values one could conceive of. And then state two, still pretty bad, but not quite as bad. The market is down, but not quite as much. But then gradually the states become better and better until we're out to state capital N. This is the best possible state of the world anyone can imagine. This is the one in which the market portfolio is worth the highest amount, PS capital N. Now we will here have to make an approximation in order to keep our analysis tractable, in order to work through all of the algebra. And this assumption will be one that says that the states are arranged not just in order going from worst to best, but also they're arranged and chosen so that there's a constant increment. That symbol at the end of the uh, third line on this slide is delta. That's the Greek letter delta, the lowercase version of delta. So we'll imagine that as you go from state one to state two, state two to state three, all the way out to state n, or in other words, as you go from any state i to the next best state, i plus one, the value of the entire market portfolio goes up by some constant amount, delta. Now that involves an approximation because the value of the market portfolio can vary more or less continuously over an entire range. But if you choose n, the number of states to begin with being very, very large, you can make the space between the value of the market portfolio in each of those states arbitrarily small. That is, you can choose uh, a sufficiently small value for delta, you can make the approximation better and better, in other words, by choosing to work with more and more states. So maybe we can think of the market portfolio, let's say, as being represented adequately by the Standard & Poor's 500 index, an index of the value of a portfolio that consists of 500 of the biggest stocks issued by the biggest corporations in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Uh, and then we could say maybe delta is equal to 1 or delta e is equal to 10. And we'll rank the states worst to best. And each state of the world will correspond to a state of the world where the Standard and Poor's 500 goes up by 1 point or by 10 points, whatever the value of delta may be, working from one state upwards to the next best state. And here is the trading strategy that Bonds and Miller and Breeden and Nitzenberger identified, the trading strategy or the portfolio that allows you to replicate the payouts on a contingent claim for any particular state of the world in this framework. And again, keep in mind that the way we've set this up, there could be dozens, hundreds, or maybe even thousands of different states of the world, depending on how much you want to keep track of and how accurate you want your approximations to be. So in order to see how this works, let's fix a particular state, state I. And what we wish to do is to form a portfolio that replicates the payouts on a contingent claim for state I. That would be a dollar in a particular state, state I and zero otherwise. And the particular strategy that Breeden, Litzenberger, Bonds, and Miller came up with is the one shown at the top of this slide. By one call, would strike, strike price equal to the value of the portfolio, say the S&P 500, in state I minus one. That is the state that is one state worse than the one that you're interested in. And given our previous assumption that the value of the portfolio or the stock index uh, goes up by a constant amount delta as you go from state to state, from worst to best, that means the strike price 
for uh, this particular call would be PSI minus one, which is PSI minus delta. Then you write or sell two calls with the strike price equal to the value of the portfolio PSI in the particular state I that you're interested in. And you buy one call with strike price equal to PI, PSI plus one. That's the value in the state of the world that's just one better, delta higher than the value of the portfolio in this particular state I. Down at the bottom of this slide, here's some notation that we can use to keep track of the prices of these different options and therefore the value of the portfolio as a whole. If you let V0 be the value at time zero of an option on the market portfolio, so that would be S with strike price K, that means the cost of assembling this portfolio is you've got to buy one call with strike price PSI minus delta. That corresponds to point one on the list, the uh, procedure to construct a portfolio at the top. We also need to buy one call with strike price PSI plus delta. That's the purchase indicated in uh, on item number three up above. And by writing two calls with strike price PSI, you're going to be obligated to deliver the portfolio of stocks at price PSI if the individual to whom you've sold the call demands uh, that you deliver the portfolio at that particular price at, at time one. But in the meantime, the buyer of those options gives you two times the value of the option or the price of the option. That's the last term down at the bottom. Two times VO, the value of a stock option on this index with strike price PSI. Now let's figure out what the payoffs on this portfolio of options will be in all possible states of the world when we look ahead to period t equals one. And what we wish to see is that this portfolio of options replicates the payouts made by contingent claims in the sense that it should make a payout in one and only one state of the world at time t equals one. And that one particular state of the world should be state I. We're interested in synthesizing contingent claims for state I. So take a look at the table on uh, this slide. Let's imagine first that the actual price of the stock P turns out to be below PSI minus delta. So this means that we're looking at a state of the world that is worse than state I, and therefore the value of the portfolio must be less than or equal to PSI minus delta. And now let's ask, what are the payouts that will be made by each of our three options? Well, with the actual price of the option being less than or equal to PSI minus delta, all of the three options with strike prices PSI minus delta, PSI and PSI plus delta are going to be out of the money at time t equals zero. So in the top row of this table, we're seeing that the value of the calls, all three in these states, will be zero. And the payoff made, therefore, by the portfolio as a whole over on the right-hand column is also going to be equal to zero. Let's imagine, by contrast, that state I actually comes about at time t equals one, so that the value of the portfolio is equal to PSI. In this case, the call that you've purchased with a strike price PSI minus delta will have value delta because that call will allow you to buy the entire portfolio at price PSI minus delta and the market allows you to turn around and sell the entire portfolio for the price PSI. So you pocket the difference equal to delta. The two other calls the call that you've written with strike price PSI and the other call that you've purchased with price PSI plus delta, they're going to expire out of the money in state I. So the payouts there are zero. So as we sum up 
moving from the left to the right in the middle row, we can see that the payout from this portfolio of options will equal delta. Then lastly, let's think about any state that is better than the state that is one better than in turn state I. In this particular case, all three calls in this portfolio will be in the money upon expiration. The, port, uh, the call that you've bought with strike price PSI minus delta is going to give you a payout equal to P. That's the actual portfolio market portfolio value minus PSI plus delta, so minus the uh, strike price. In between, the two call options that you've written will require you to pay two, because you've written two calls, times P, the value of the portfolio, minus PSI, since these call options that you've written require you to deliver two units of the portfolio worth P, but at the price PSI at time T equals one. And then lastly, the call that you've purchased with strike price PSI plus delta, that's going to have value P minus PSI minus delta. In other words, the value of the portfolio minus the strike price at which you can purchase the portfolio, that's PSI plus delta. And now something remarkable happens if you total up again all of the payoffs working from the left to the right in the bottom row, you find that all of the payouts that you receive cancel with the payouts that you must make so that the total payoff from the portfolio is again equal to zero. So summing up, this portfolio pays out delta in state I and zero otherwise. It's equivalent to a portfolio consisting of delta contingent claims for state I. So if we can observe in options markets the prices on options to buy the market portfolio, say the price of options on the Starin Poor's 500 stock index, which in fact those prices can be observed for the United States today because those stock index options are traded in U.S. financial markets. We can take the cost of assembling the portfolio, which we calculated previously, that's at the top of the slide, the first equation for VPO, and then we can observe that since this portfolio of options is equivalent to a portfolio of delta contingent claims for state I, it's got to be the case that if we take the price of the portfolio and divide by delta, that gives us QI, the price of a contingent claim for state I. And no arbitrage will guarantee that this will be the price of a contingent claim if contingent claims were traded in the US financial system, because if the contingent claim was selling for less than the portfolio of options, everybody would be buying contingent claims, selling options, putting upward price pressure on the price for the claims, downward pressure on the price for the options until the cost of the portfolio and the contingent claim came back into line. And conversely, if the claims price happened to be higher than the cost of assembling the portfolio of options, the opposite would occur. Everyone would buy up the options, sell the contingent claims until the equality was restored. And importantly, notice that we actually don't have to buy the options if all we want to do is to price the contingent claim. If we actually wish to purchase the contingent claim, then in that case we would want to assemble the portfolio of options so that we could collect the payouts that we wanted. But if all we want to know are the prices of contingent claims, if contingent claims were traded in the U.S. economy, we can take observations of option prices. And again, because options on the Standard & Poor's 500 are traded in the U.S. financial system, we can look those up online. And we can substitute those option prices into the formula we just derived and compute the price at which various contingent claims would sell at, again, if contingent claims actually traded in the U.S. economy. 
So these clever insights made in the late 1970s by Bonds and Miller, by Breeden and Litzenberger, really opened the door to the usefulness of the Arrow de Brew framework by showing us how we could go beyond the simple examples with just two or three states looking ahead to the end of the investment horizon and use the information in options and in particular in options on the S&P 500 to construct sets of contingent claims prices for the U.S. economy, even allowing for the possibility for there to be dozens, maybe even hundreds or thousands of possible states of the world looking ahead from today uh, out to a year from now or whenever the end of the investment horizon might be. The value in this approach is enormous because once we have contingent claim prices, we can go ahead and use those contingent claims prices to price any other asset, no matter how complex uh, its structure of payouts across different states of the world in the future. And we can do this without necessarily having to make any assumptions about the form of anybody's utility function, quadratic or otherwise, or without assuming anything about uh, the distribution of asset returns, like the idea that asset returns are normally distributed. We need that for the CAPM. We don't need that to implement the Arrow de Brew approach. And one final point, and this will lead us to our next topic of conversation, if options on the S&P 500 are not actually traded, although they are, but even if they weren't, we could use an option pricing formula to figure out what their prices should be. And the most famous option pricing formula of, of all is the Black-Scholes formula. We'll take a little break now, but when we come back, we'll take a look at the uh, Black-Scholes formula we'll derive our own version of the Black-Scholes formula, and we'll see how Black-Scholes relies on arguments that are very, very similar, not quite identical to these Arrow de Brew arguments involving contingent claims, but very, very similar to the reasoning that underlies these exercises going back and forth between the prices of complex securities on the one hand and these fictitious assets, Arrow de Brew contingent claims, as analytic devices on the other.